So today we'll be going through three different uh, Illumina assembly and analysis workflows using the LaserGene Genomic Suite. And uh, we'll, we'll start off with a little, little bit of a slideshow where I'll introduce you to DNA Star, uh, and then we will set up some assemblies using our Seekman Engine software, and then doing some of the downstream analysis. So I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Uh, we're going to be going over quite a few topics, uh, not really deeply. We don't have enough time to do that. Um, so I, I probably won't address all the questions that you'll have, um, but of course I'll be available after the webinar through email uh, to answer any of those questions. So DNA Star is uh, located in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we have our sales team here, our developers here, um, and it's very convenient to have uh, people located in one location. That means that we are very well equipped to uh, support our customers. So if you do have questions, um, of course, the sales team or myself can answer them. We also have developers um, that can answer some of the uh, more advanced questions as well. Now, DNA Star has been a pioneer in genomics uh, for many years. Uh, Dr. Fred Blattner is the founder of DNA Star, um, and back in the 1990s, uh, his lab uh, sequenced the E. coli K12 genome. Uh, so you can see there's a number of folks here. Guy Plunkett um, is still with the company um, and does a lot of our annotation work for our services. Uh, for the past 26 years, uh, we've produced software for researchers, and this is really research-grade software. And so there's been a number of publications dating all the way back to 1985. Um, DNA Star is the most frequently cited company um, for uh, um, bioinformatics software. So our software is uh, powerful and easy to use. And so our, our uh, intention is to make uh, these tools available to regular researchers so that they can take sequence data and do their own assemblies. Uh, oftentimes you'll want to run multiple assemblies to get the best or optimal results, something that your core facility might be reluctant to do for you. So it kind of puts the control and the power in your hands so that you can um, really have control over both assembly and downstream analysis. Our Seekman Engine software runs on Mac, PC, and Linux. It's 64-bit. Uh, we'll spend some time there setting up assemblies with Seekman Engine. Uh, we, we are agnostic to platform, so while we assemble Illumina data, we can also sem assemble Ion Torrent and 454 and PacBio data. Um, our analysis tools are primarily found in Seekman Pro and ArrayStar, and we'll take a look at those programs as well. Uh, the capacity for the software is very high, so we can look at multiple exomes, multiple genomes, RNA-seq data sets, um, and again, this is uh, mostly done on desktop computers. The cost is low, so for under $5,000, academics can gain access to the full laser gene genomics suite. And of course, we provide great support with every purchase. And so we have webinars like this uh, you know, once a month or a little bit more than that. Um, I also do personal webinars. And so if you are evaluating the software right now and you have a, a workflow that we don't cover today or if you want to go into a workflow in more detail, um, I, I'm available for one-on-one -on -one webinars to go through your particular workflows. And that's something I, I enjoy doing. I spend a good part of my time uh, doing uh, webinars like that with customers. Uh, something new with, with uh, our software is that we are moving up to the cloud. Uh, we'll look a little bit today at um, Seekman Engine up on Illumina's base space, um, and we'll also be introducing a DNA Star Cloud later this year um, with, with some of our applications. So one of the first questions that we'll get from customers um, really is, is how powerful is our software? And uh, so one of the things that we like to show is that the performance that you can get from our assembler in particular, Seekman Engine, um, is very, very good. And, and this can be done on a desktop computer that is very reasonable, you know, a Dell computer that sells for less than $3,000. Of course, if you, if you can build your own computers, you can do, th do this at an even lower cost and put together powerful machines um, for, you know, more than a neighborhood of $2,000. Uh, so the data sets that, we're, that, that we have, this, this is from our website. Uh, this will actually be updated. These times have gotten a little bit faster with the release that's coming out here this spring. But to give you an idea, a human genome data set, um, this is going to be 3.5 billion Illumina reads at nearly 40x coverage. Our software can do the assembly and all the SNP analysis and structural variant analysis and produce a BAM file output with all the accessory files in under 24 hours. Um, exome projects, like we'll look at today, are roughly two hours per exome. 
Um, if we batch them together, in this case we've done eight human exomes in one project. Uh, we saved some time, so eight exomes in this case took about 14 hours. Uh, smaller genomes, Arabidopsis and E. coli, uh, may be measured in an hour or just a few minutes to do the assembly. And even E. coli at almost 1,000x coverage is just, just several minutes of assembly time. RNA-seq is more variable um, depending on how deeply you sequence the transcriptome and generally takes you know, an hour to just a few hours depending on the size of the, uh, of the data set. And so these are really nice, fast assembly times. Of course, there's, there's lots of assemblers that do different workflows. Um, very few of them, though, can do um, a wide array of different workflows and do all of them well. Usually they're very specific to platform, type of assembly, and then you'd have to you know, use a different assembler for another type of assembly. For example, de novo assembly, um, Seekman Engine is a, a really stringent and accurate de novo assembler. Um, assigning benchmarks or metrics for de novo assembly is a little bit more challenging because really what, what counts the most is how accurate the assembly is. And so, um, and that's more difficult to do, but so here's some, some typical benchmarks just giving you number of reads, coverage, and Contig N50 is probably the most commonly used benchmark. And you can see with Illumina data and E. coli, we get a Contig N50 of about 100,000 base pairs. And it takes about 20 minutes or so to do the assembly. Um, Seekman Engine is also an excellent assembler of transcriptome data. So if you're working with non-model organisms and uh, you need to build a reference set of mRNA sequences, uh, Seekman Engine does a great job with those types of assemblies. And the assembly time here is going to be several hours to maybe as much as 12 hours, depending on how much data you have. We also have another genome. This is up a bacillus genome that's up on DaySpace that we'll look at um, a little bit later today. And the bacillus genome is about a million reads at 30x coverage, and we get a really large contig and 50 of over 200,000 base pairs. And so these are really, um, uh, again, very stringent de novo assemblies. They produce very high quality results. Um, so if you're, if you're working with microbial genomes, small eukaryotes, or transcriptomes, um, Seekman Engine's a great, a great choice. So there are a number of workflows that we support. This isn't a list of all the workflows. Of course, there are, the software is very flexible, so we can accommodate a wide different um, uh, array of workflows, you know, things like metagenomics and 16S RNA and um, some things that I don't have up here. Uh, but here, here are some of the main workflows, including genome resequencing and exome assembly and RNA-seq, de novo transcriptome. Um, we have a workflow for automated bacterial genome closure, um, and then we have de novo genome assembly. And so we're going to look at uh, the exome and RNA-seq and the automated genome closure, and then we'll take a look at our de novo assembler up on base base at the end of the webinar today. So at this point, I'd like to jump into the software, and we'll take a look at how we set up a project, and then we'll look at some of the, the, the downstream from there. So I'm going to open up Seekman Engine. And again, on my start menu, I could go to, uh, we can see DNA Star, Seekman Engine 4. I can launch from here. Um, there's also, we have a navigator that I don't have up now that we can also launch our programs from. Um, Seekman Engine, uh, what we're looking at here, we call a wizard. And this Seekman Engine wizard sets up projects um, for us. And so it allows us to select the type of workflow that we're doing, and then it will start to pick optimal def default parameters for that type of workflow. So it's meant to make um, setting up all different types of workflows as easy as possible with as uh, little uh, input from the customer um, as is needed to get a really nice assembly. And so Seekman Engine, we usually start with a new assembly project, and we just click Next in the wizard, and then we can pick our project type, and really, as we start to pick the type of project, this really starts to set some of the first parameters that will be optimal for that type of assembly. For example, if I pick genome assembly, um, that will have a different, we'll handle repetitive reads differently than if we're aligning or doing a metagenomic assembly. And so we make those choices for the, for the end user. And when we make these choices, it affects the next page in the wizard. So you can see with genome assembly, this actually gives me the most options um, for branches in the road, essentially for types of projects that I might do. 
So for a genome assembly, I may have just a templated assembly, normal workflow that's unlimited in size, and I get a BAM file output. Um, I can also do a de novo genome assembly. There's also a reference guided assembly with gap closure. That's a newer workflow that we introduced late in 2012. Um, I have a webinar that was recorded back in December that covers this workflow in detail. We'll, we'll touch on it later today. And then there's also a legacy workflow for some of our long-term users where they have some special, um, special workflows that they use our software for. So that's a genome assembly. We get multiple choices here. If I pick targeted resequencing, then I really only have one output option. If I'm doing an alignment, a uh, human exome alignment, I'll be aligning to a human genome or a set of reference sequences and producing a BAM file output. And this BAM file is, um, it's not an editable output, but it's an output that's very efficient so that I can take this output and open it on uh, a laptop computer or a, you know, a regular 32-bit computer that does not have all the power of my assembly computer. Now I can set up my project files, uh, assign a name to the project, um, an output folder, and then also pick a temporary file location. And the temporary file location is important for um, these templated assemblies. And there are actually some requirements, uh, hardware requirements, depending mostly on how much data you'll have and how much data that you'll be assembling. And so there's a link to our website. I won't go through all this in great detail. But for reference-guided assemblies, we can see that we have four different projects, and they vary in size from the smallest being a yeast genome all the way up to a human genome. And the core computer is, is roughly the same, 16 gigs of RAM, quad-core processor. Um, but as the data sets get larger, you'll need more space to write the temporary files. And so this is just something to be aware of if you're evaluating the software that you may need you know, enough space for your exome assemblies to process these temporary files. And that's what really gives this program tremendous speed is it uses RAM, CPU, and disk space to crunch through the data. We can also add a template file. Um, these template files now to align against can be GenBank files, they can be FASTA files, you know, files that you've downloaded. If you're working in a main uh, model organism, um, DNA Star also produces genome template packages. These genome template packages um, bring some database information um, and associates it with the, uh, the chromosome sequences. So this will be DV, SNP, COSMIC, and GURP are going to be in these packages associated with the reference files. And we have a number of organisms now, Rabidopsis and cow and C. elegans and zebrafish, human, mouse, rat, um, rice. And so we build these upon request, provided there is actually DB SNP information that's been curated for the customers. And so if you're working in a main model organism, um, these genome template packages provide a richer uh, variant analysis because that SNP information in DB SNP and GURP is provided up front to the assembler. So it can start to do statistical SNP analysis on known and novel SNPs as the data is streaming through the, the assembler. Uh, then we're asked to input the sequence files. Um, for Illumina users, we distinguish between the, the, the short reads, and now most users, of course, have reads longer than 50 base pairs. Uh, you can also uh, pick reads from other platforms. And the, the type of data that we're going to load in is uh, FASTQ data. And so these are files. They'll have sometimes a FASTQ extension, sometimes a text extension. And we can load these in just by adding files. Um, and if I want to align multiple samples at one time within a project, I can click or select multiplex data. And then I can customize the names. And so um, in this case, I have uh, different groups, ethnic groups for my exomes. I may have multiple files per group or just one file per group. And I can edit the names by double clicking and type a name in manually. Um, the newer version of the software coming out this spring will automatically do some, some auto naming depending on how your folders are named. So it'll, uh, if you have larger data sets with you know, hundreds of files, it can do some auto naming for you. And so this allows us now to set up multiple samples, align them to a common reference, and that will facilitate our downstream analysis in many cases. Uh, we have some uh, assembly options here. 
Um, with Illumina data, we typically will just stick with defaults. We've run thousands of assemblies. We know that these defaults uh, will work quite well. Uh, we can set a minimum match percentage. Um, if you're going to change one parameter, it is the minimum match percentage, and that sets the stringency of the assembly. So this is the percent that the read must match the template in order to align. And so if I change this number and set this at 85, that allows for more mismatch, the less stringent assembly. I could increase this to 97 and make a more stringent assembly. So that's the one parameter that you might change. Um, if, you're having, if you have some data that is maybe not typical or you're having some technical issues, um, there are more advanced options um, that, that where you can make some adjustments uh, for alignment. I wouldn't change any of these without consulting with, with someone at DNA Star. We can make recommendations here. Um, there's also some SNP options that um, the default now is for our SNP um, calculations to use a diploid Bayesian statistical model. Um, for some data sets, uh, that doesn't really apply. So for instance, if I'm looking at rare variants in a, a tumor sample, um, I'm not expecting a diploid condition, I can change this just to a simple percent. And what we have below here are some minimal filtering that are applied to remove the noise from, uh, from, from the SNP analysis. And I can actually remove all filtering here and this is actually grayed out here. It might not show so well through the webinar. But if I don't want to have any filtering at all, and I want to see every single base pair difference with every aligned read, I can go to simple percent and drop this percentage to zero, and then I will see everything in the SNP report that is uh, a variation. So once you've set, again, it's just setting pathways to your, your file, selecting your workflow, sticking with default, um, options, um, and now Seekman Engine is ready to assemble. And what's happening in the background here is we're getting a text script that's written out. Um, this script is going to be saved to the output folder, and the text script really is just instructions to the assembler. And, and we can read through the script and see, okay, I've got, multi, I've got paired end data, I have multiple conditions or multiple samples, and a number of parameters that are used. Advanced users might decide to run scripts in batches or um, you know, copy and paste multiple scripts together to run multiple assemblies. So you can actually run Seekman Engine from the script, from the command prompt, you know, if, if that's how you'd prefer to run the software. When I click Assemble, um, I can watch a log here. And so provided my temporary file, my, my, my disk is ready, we can wake it up here and we'll start to see some information spool into the log, and I can also start my task manager. And I'm just going to sort here so we can see the CPU usage. You can see we're at 99% of the CPUs right at the moment. So as we're loading data in, this is an eight core machine. Um, the software is really optimized to use everything that your computer has to get the fastest possible assembly. So right now, it's uh, at least initially in the assembly, it's going to use all of my cores, and it's using a good chunk of RAM, about half of my RAM right now. And it'll actually settle down a little bit. Um, a little bit later, it will uh, use less data. Um, so I can do other things like email on the computer. And, and, but initially, uh, I'll just kind of watch things like this and make sure that my hardware is running as expected. Um, this log file can be exported. So if you're running assemblies and you run into a problem, you can save the log out, email that to DNA Star, and we can help troubleshoot. When this assembly is done, uh, there will be a button here. Uh, actually, we'll get a report that will give us the metrics of the assembly. And then we'll have a button that can automatically launch the project in Seekman Pro. So if you have the LaserGene Core Suite installed on your computer, um, you can start to do your analysis right away. If you do the assemblies on one computer and you want to do the analysis on another, um, then the output is, so I'll just stop that. So then the output will be a BAM.assembly file. And we'll just take a look at that. So here's, uh, it's a dot .assembly. It looks like a folder on a, on a Windows machine. This is just an exome comparison for human chromosome 1. It's something that we use for demos about 8 gigs in size, so we can move it around on flash drives fairly easily. 
Um, so this is, these are all the sequences that are associated with human chromosome 1 in the assembly. And you can see there's a BAM file that's almost 5 gigs. That has all the layout information, an index file. And then there's other information. And this is the information that SeqMan uses to uh, make the analysis much, much smoother than it would be if we just took this BAM file into a genome browser. So there are things like coverage information, SNP information, um, structural variant information, gapping in the templates, um, template features. So we load all that information uh, because a BAM file on its own doesn't contain all that information. So the output from our assembler is an enriched BAM file that really is nice to analyze in SeqMan Pro. And oh. And so when we open a file in SeqMan Pro, we'll see the list of reference sequences. This is an assembly to human chromosome 1, and we also get a report file. And the report file will tell us you know, which version of software we ran, and this report file we can get from the project report. And again, this is a file that can be useful you know, for troubleshooting. You know, if you have some questions about your assembly, you can email this file, and we can look at some of these metrics. And it's not the most human readable output, but there are some things that are interesting here where we can look at the number of query sequences. So that's the number of sequences in our um, data set. So this is 1.2 billion sequences. And we get MER counts, and then we get you know how many bad sequences there were, and we get how many were actually exported out into the BAM file format, and we get an assembly time as well. So it gives us some of the metrics we can troubleshoot to see if there's a data problem. There's also the script is copied here. So the report file is very useful there. Um, I can open up the assembly by double clicking and then scrolling. And I can start to scroll through the project. Of course, human chromosome 1 is really too large to effectively scroll through. So we're going to navigate this, typically using a SNP report. And so the SNP report really becomes the most uh, active area for um, doing the analysis on these projects. And I'll just resize this a bit here. And we'll spend some time looking at this. So the SNP report, uh, you can see the total number here, 375,486 possible SNPs at this point. And what our report will show is largely an unfiltered SNP report. There's some minimal filtering that SeqMan Engine does. Um, but there's still, we allow, we, we err on the side of caution to allow um, a lot of sequencing errors, uh, you know, to come through and allow the user to apply some filters to separate um, sequencing noise from true SNP signal. And so we can filter this report um, using the filters and controls at the top of the report. And so we can see how this number changes when we start to apply some very reasonable filters. One of them that we might apply that really uses a combination of depth considerations and quality considerations is the p-value. And it's the probability that the SNP is not the reference sequences. And we call it, we abbreviate this the p not ref. And by default, it's set at 50, but we might set this at 95. And we can see that that reduces the SNP somewhat. Um, so we've, we've now made a more stringent filter there. We can also differentiate between annotated SNPs and annotated SNPs will have a DB SNP entry. So if I scroll to the right here, we can see we have a DB SNP ID, and I could go look up that SNP in DB SNP to get the information on that particular SNP. And so this is, uh, it looks it up through the RS number, and here we can get all the allele frequencies and any information that uh, NCBI has on that SNP entry. So these are all the SNPs that are in DB SNP that we found in our project. We also have, of course, novel SNPs. So here's SNPs that do not have an RS entry. Um, I may also apply another filter, and that's to you know show SNPs that are in coding regions or generate coding changes. And you can see by applying a coding change filter that we've reduced the number of SNPs now to under 10,000. So that's a pretty significant filter. Uh, there's a number of columns here. Um, you may not need all of them, so you can, you can tailor this SNP report as well to make some columns appear or disappear. And so for, for Illumina data, I'm not 
is interested in homopolymers, I might, through the splicing um, snips, and so I can go through and just kind of customize this look. Um, maybe I don't need cosmic for this particular reporting. So I can condense this down a bit, and now we can see there's more information for particular SNPs. Um, and so we can go through the columns. Uh, the first column is whether or not a SNP has been verified or not. Uh, this means, you know, have we checked it to see, you know, is it a, is it a SNP that, that uh, we think is real? You know, you might do this with your novel SNPs to say, well, look, here's a, a SNP that, and I can double click on my assembly and go and look at that assembly. So it's a really nice interactive and very responsive report that allows me then to click on a SNP and then go look at the alignment of all my samples. And I can collapse this down. And so now what we're looking at are the pseudo consensus sequences for all the different individuals. And if there's a variant base that's called, that's um, shaded in blue. And we have a reference sequence here. Again, it's human chromosome one. And so we can see the annotations that are there. And I can expand and look at one sample at a time and collapse and look at different samples. So again, very nice performance. You know, I can scroll through the chromosome. I can go back to the SNP report, look at another SNP. Here's a SNP that's only in one sample. And then I notice, well, that's pretty thin there. You know, there's only, there's only two sequences aligned for that sample. So I could set a depth of coverage threshold as well. And so now I have a minimum depth of coverage. So that, that's another manual filter that I, that I applied. And now the SNPs that show up should be in areas that have at least 10x coverage. So again, a really nice interface for doing this sort of analysis. Um, we also get uh, reference base, call base, impact, SNP percent, the probability, and I'm just going to scroll, and you can see feature name, DNA change, protein change, depth, GURP scores, which is, which is a, um, a rate profiling for uh, across uh, evolution. So a higher GURP score means that these are ba these are bases that are conserved amongst humans and other mammals. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a way to differentiate between SNPs that are otherwise hard to differentiate. So if a SNP has a high GURP score, um, it might be more impactful on, on that individual. So it's a, it's a great interface then for doing SNP analysis, interactive with the alignment views. Now there's other views that we won't have uh, time to, we, we won't go into in this workflow, um, but under uh, you know, Contig there's coverage reports, structural variation reports, strategy views. Um, that are also available you know, to look at this data. Now, with SNP analysis on projects like this, um, if I want to answer questions like, you know, which SNPs do these ethnic groups have in common, or which are unique to certain ethnic groups, or certain samples that you have, uh, we can do this by, in SeqMan on a limited basis by looking at you know, SNP by SNP or gene by gene. Uh, but to make those larger associations, we actually have another tool and that's in our ArrayStar software for making more wide-scale associations. So ArrayStar um, can also take the BAM.assembly file from SeqMan Engine, import it as a SNP project. You can see that it automatically recognizes the ethnic groups that were present in that project. And now we can uh, do some analysis here. And so the first place that we'll look is just a SNP table. And the SNP table now is uh, showing about 300,000 SNPs, and we can see what really becomes a summary for our SNPs. And so here's a reference position, and we get a gene name, the reference sequence, and then we get the called sequence for each one of our um, individuals. And so we have, it really becomes a summary of that SeqMan SNP report. So if you have a gene of interest, you can go and, and look and do a comparison amongst your samples. Um, it's also possible to bring in additional information um, from outside databases. And I have a little bit of that displayed here. Minor allele frequencies, um, some genotype counts from different ethnic groups, some DB SNP ID observed genotypes. And, and we can bring in this information by doing an import annotations. And in this case, I imported a VCF file 
from Washington University's Exome Variant Database. And that contains a huge amount of, of annotation information regarding uh, the SNPs associated with these exomes. And you can populate the columns here in ArrayStar by clicking on the ABC tab. And all these columns, all this information can be brought in from the different columns. So a polyfen link, for example. And we can get some information about, you know, um, from polyfen. So it's a great place to pull in additional information to associate it with your SNPs. Uh, and of course, we can make columns, um, you know, we can remove columns. I can remove all the columns to the right, you know, add columns back. You know, so it's a nice way to um, nice way to bring in information and make these kind of comparisons with this information present. So, so that's how we can use the SNP table. Now, there's still a lot of SNPs here, so we usually want to filter to try to find SNPs that are interesting. And that's really, at this point, what a Raystar is meant to do. Whether it's SNP data or gene expression data, we can apply filters. And I've already done some pre-filters, but I can filter the gene and SNP level, and I can filter by annotation, expression, um, ontology, and I can and I can search different subgroups. So just as an example, I can make a set here and say, show me all the um, genes that are affected by SNPs in the African group, and then I can choose a criteria. You know, in this case, non-synonymous SNPs with GURP scores of a certain number. So I can apply very intricate filtering to create gene sets now that have SNPs of a particular criteria. And so I can do this search and now I have 458 genes that meet that search. I can save that as a set. Save it and I can come back to it and use it. So if I have a gene set, now I have a set for African. I did this ahead of time, African, Asian, and European SNPs. Um, and I look for non-synonymous SNPs with a fairly high GURP score. And now I can run a Venn diagram and make more comparisons. You know, look at the SNPs at the intersection of the Venn diagram, create a gene set, or look at SNPs that are, affect genes that are unique to the different data sets. And so it's a really nice way to take very large amounts of data and apply some filters and then find genes or SNPs of, of interest. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a crash course in the SNP analysis workflow. Um, we're going to go back to Seekman Engine. And Matt, we do have a couple of questions. Sure. One is uh, relating to Seekman Engine. If you have a, uh, a mixed data set, say, with short and long reads, what's the, the best approach to take for setting up that assembly? Uh, the best approach is to treat it like all short reads. Um, and what will happen is that the... The MER sizes that will be used will be geared uh, based on the short reads. And what will happen is you'll get a little bit slower performance when the long reads are processed, but you will not get any, uh, um, it, it, will, it will not uh, uh, negatively impact the assembly at all. Great. And then another question the, the annotations you were showing, I think both in Seekman Pro and in ArrayStar, are those coming from the reference file or a VCF file? Um, both. So the, uh, the GenBank files that are the chromosome reference sequences, they contain some of the feature information. Uh, the annotations that I sh was, so that's what you see in SeqMan. Um, what I was showing in ArrayStar, the polyfen and the allele frequencies, those were imported through the VCF file format. Great, thank you. Thanks. So now SeqMan Engine, um, if we're going to set up a, a transcriptome project, or an RNA-seq project for the purpose of, of uh, comparing gene expression values. Again, I can create a, a new assembly project, pick transcriptome, templated. Um, of course, we also do de novo assemblies. Oops. And we can just set up our project here. output folder. We have our temporary file location already specified. I'm going to add a genome template package and I keep this on my data drive. So I like to, I should also point out, I like to keep my data on a separate drive. My temp files are processed on my RAID drive and my operating system I keep on a C drive and that gives me uh, the best possible performance rather than 
putting everything on the same drive. So here's our human genome template. And I'm just going to add some data here. And so I can jump up to my network where I have some, and this is some Illumina data um, from different tissue types. That. So again, I can load in multiple samples. It could be three files, it could be a hundred files, and assign a name. And stick with default parameters, and we're ready to go. So it's very easy to set up the project. When it's done, we can launch in Seekman Pro. So again, it's much like the exome analysis. Um, we get our project report, which shows us our output here. We can take a look at the assembly. So we're only expecting some sparse alignment to expressed exons. Again, I can go to a SNP report if I want, depending on what type of analysis I want to do. go to that point in the assembly and look at my aligned data. I'm holding my control alt down, I can collapse and now I can see all my tissue types. Um, it's also so it's very similar if I'm doing SNP analysis to what I would do with an exome analysis. I can also launch um, strategy view and this this takes this is going to build a view that is uh, uh, for a genome like like a genome browser type view. And I don't usually look at it with an exome assembly, but in a transcriptome, I might really want to look at my assembled data here. And I'm just going to zoom in. You'll notice, you know, the performance is real nice. I can easily move um, down to a particular gene. I see the depth of coverage over the top of my exons here. I can hover and see which gene this is. And then below the kind of the browser view, we have all the aligned sequences and they're color coordinated for different types of sequences. And I'm just going to show some split sequences. These are the most interesting. And so I can, you know, make, depending on the type of project I have, different subclasses of sequences will be interesting. In this case, it's the reads that fall on exon boundaries, and we call them pink. And so I can look, and I can see exons, reads that fell on two adjoining exons, and the read could be split and then mapped to adjoining exons. And I see in some cases we get different um, exon combinations. So here we're skipping one exon. We have a read that maps here. And so I can kind of scroll through my gene and get really nice resolution of detail of where these exon, exon junctions are and where we have alternate splicing events. So it's a really nice way to look at these assemblies. And I can double click And I can go and look at you know, those points in the assembly, too, and look at the data. And we'll see Seekman Engine has a really nice capacity to trim back regions that do not map, so it can align just partial reads that align to some of these exons. And so again, it's a great place if you're looking for some novel exon usage and you want to um, visualize the data. It's a really nice, efficient interface for doing that and also for, for SNP analysis. If I want to do expression analysis uh, between my sets, again, that's an ArrayStar tool. So I can take the same project, import it in ArrayStar. Oops, not that one. And so I can import the project into ArrayStar just like I did Seekman Pro. And now I have different tissue types of RNA-seq data. Um, I can highlight a project and I get statistics for that project, how many bases there were, how many bases aligned, that sort of thing. Um, we can look at scatter plots um, between different tissue types. I can right click here and change the tissue types. Uh, 
Um, so again, Array Star allows me to um, oh, select something there. So here's a scatter plot. I can filter now to try to find. There's 2,288 genes. This is human chromosome one. I can start to do some filtering. Here's the genes with a two-fold change, a four-fold, an eight-fold change. Um, I can do advanced filtering, and I can look at um, things like fold change, or I could just do uh, some combinations. I can add another. You know, I might say, well, only show me where the expression level meets a certain criteria. So I can apply a filter here and get a, a subgroup of these genes. And so this is a subgroup then of 233 genes. And again, I can populate my table um, with um, Go information and also the expression values. And so these are log two base values. And I can also bring in things like uh, the counts. So here's the raw counts of the aligned reads. And I could also bring in something like uh, the repeat count. And so when ArrayStar does its expression calculations, it's going to combine the repeat count plus the raw count of uniquely mapped reads and come up with the actual expression value. And so I can apply filters, and then find gene subsets of interest based on, on filters that I would apply, and then create a table of those genes. So it's, again, it's like the SNP analysis in the sense that we have lots of data points, we apply filters, find the gene sets that are interesting to us, and then do additional analysis. And there's some, a few more things we can do here that I don't quite have time to go into. Um, we can generate heat maps. We can do um, you know, show ontologies, um, and of course we can import information. So I can show an ontology report like this. I can also import additional annotations from other databases. Here's my VCF file, but you can see we have microarray and then other types of databases where we can import annotation information. You might also have annotations that are just in a CSV or a text file. So if your annotations haven't been curated completely, um, but you have them in a table, you can bring that table in and associate those annotations with the genes that are in, that are in your project. Another thing that ArrayStar can do is combine experiments from different types of projects. So I can import experiments from microarray or RNA-seq or ChIP-seq or my SNP analysis, and when I click on this, it allows me now to bring in a different type of a project. So I could go and um, combine my gene expression analysis with SNP analysis and find gene sets and intersections of genes that maybe show interesting SNPs or up and down regulation of genes. So it's a, it's a nice place to um, combine multiple different analyses. So I know that's just kind of scratching the surface on ArrayStar. Uh, we have, uh, again, webinars that are hour-long specific to exome analysis and transcriptome analysis. Um, and then I'm, we're going to look at one more data set here, and that it is our automated uh, genome workflow. So I'll just back up here in our wizard. And so our, our automated genome workflow, let's just go back here to... is going to take a reference genome and use that to guide the assembly of, uh, of a new strain. And really the, the kind of the question that you have if you're working with uh, bacterial genomes is should I take a de novo approach or should I take a, uh, use the best possible reference sequence? And oftentimes we don't know the answer to that question um, until you do both. You do a de novo assembly and see what the results are. Um, if, you get a, if you have really nice data, Illumina MySeq data that's 250 base pairs long, it's extremely clean. You get great assemblies with that sort of data. And you might get a genome, a de novo assembly that, you know, 25 contigs, um, that if you put 25 contigs together, you have your entire genome. Um, other, other genomes, you're, you're not that lucky. You might have 100 or more contigs that you would have to place in, in an order in a scaffold and close gaps on. 
Um, and in that case, you might look for the best possible reference sequence. And if you've got a close enough reference genome, there may be fewer than 100 structural variants, you know, a few thousand SNPs. Um, our automated workflow can use that reference genome to get you to a much closer position of a closed genome automatically just within an, in an hour. So it literally takes what could be weeks of manual effort closing gaps and reduces that, you know, 90% of that work down to an hour or so in an assembly. And so this is a workflow, again, I, I, we have a, a, a full-length webinar on it, but what, what the assembler is doing is it's aligning your data to the best possible reference, and it's finding structural variants. Insertions can be identified by trim points, where sequences are trimmed back at the insertion spot. So we find these based on that phenotype. Deletions are detected uh, much like our, our uh, exome exome junctions by these chimeric reads that span the deletion site, these pink split reads. Um, so it's a combination of our split reads plus oftentimes a significant drop-off in sequence coverage at that point. And so we automatically detect these, and then it's a matter of how do we resolve them. Deletions we can stitch together. Insertions are quite a bit more difficult. We have to figure out the novel sequence that's in that insertion. It could be 10 base pairs. It could be 100,000 base pairs in size. And so that's what the software is doing. Um, to set the project up, it's a, a new project, Genome Assembly, Reference Guided with Gap Closure. I'll call it AGC. And now my template file will be a bacterial genome. And so I'm using a, it's a strain of E. coli K12 that is uh, 1061. And now I can add my, let's see, let's go up one here. And let's see. So I have some Illumina data here. Oh, pardon me. We're going to add the paired data. Thirty two X coverage. I think this is about three eighty. Okay, and so I'm loading paired data because Seekman Engine uses the pair data to fill in the insertion elements. And so it, the sequences that align right up to the edge of the structural variant where the insertion is, um, there's gonna be a mate pair that then falls onto that insertion and it will pile those sequences up and eventually form a contig there, and if it's large enough, that contig in the insertion is large enough, it will overlap upstream and downstream of the insertion site and then can be aligned together. And so you have to have paired data for this workflow. And we just stick with defaults, and again, like the other workflows, it's ready to assemble, um, except the output here will be uh, actually three different files. And so what we do is we, uh, we, we save the file at Nothing has been done. It's just an alignment to the reference genome. It's, it's called no split. And then we have an intermediate file where we've done some of the uh, insertion contig building. And then we have the final file where all the gaps have been auto-closed. So it allows us to look at those intermediate steps for troubleshooting. And we will look at this first. So here is the alignment to 1061, the length is about 4.5 megabases. Um, you know, we can go and look at uh, the assembly. In this case, we're going to use the structural variation report, and that's under Contig Structural Variation Report. And the structural variation report now is going to list ins potential insertions, deletions, and indels, things that we're not quite sure what's happening there, but we know there's some kind of a variation that's occurring. And you can see that here that we have 33 structural variants that are identified uh, between these two E. coli strains. And we get a reference position, uh, the type. Um, if there's split reads around a deletion, we get a count of the split reads. We get some pair information, the distances, the feature that's occurring. So we get some additional information. This is interactive then. I can double click here 
and look at my assembly. And I can see that phenotype. My reeds have been trimmed back. This looks like an insert, insertion here. Um, and so, so again, this is an unprocessed um, assembly. And let me just make this. And so here's the strategy view. You know, it's one big, it's the whole uh, bacterial chromosome and the aligned reads. We haven't split anything up. So our algorithms then go through this structural variation report, split apart the, the reference sequence to remove the bias, stitch together the, the, the deletions, fill in the insertion sequences, use the pair information to do that, and then look for overlap and merge everything together. And so we go from a project that has 32 gaps that we would have to manually figure out if we didn't have this kind of a tool down to this project. And so this project we have um, a scaffold now, and the scaffold now is it has our reference coordinates here, um, the position information. And we went from 33 gaps down to, uh, to four gaps that are left over. And we get this original position information. Here's a scaffold in the strategy view, we can see one piece of that reference genome here, and that was actually the insertion that we looked at at 66,000 base pairs. And so we have a gap here that is yet to be resolved. And of course, Seekman has all the tools for now manually resolving these gaps. There was a webinar I did earlier this year that covered how to use the tools and editing functionalities within Seekman. Um, to merge contigs, lock contigs down, add new sequences in to man manually finish off these gaps. But the, the key point with this workflow is that you know we go from, you know, oftentimes if it's a hundred structural variants, we're, we're, we're going to be left with ten gaps left to close. So it reduces the amount of manual effort, you know, by eighty to ninety percent in almost all the cases. So it's a, it's an excellent workflow for, you know, folks that are working with microbial genomes and want a tool where they can do the assembly and a lot of the downstream closure and annotation work um, right in our software. So there's one last thing I'd like to show you, and that's uh, a little bit of our Illumina base space. Um, so it's something that's new for Illumina users. And I'll just jump up here. I'm on a new computer here, so things are, let's see, I'll just have to type it in, I guess. So this is a, a new uh, offering by Illumina that was introduced uh, late in 2012, kind of in a, in a demo mode. And MySeq and HiSeq users can access um, SeqMan Engine um, on, on this Illumina cloud. And so you need to create an account, sign up, and then you can log in. And click that again there. So I have an account here. Email and password. Okay, so we can um, go up to base space, and there's a number of applications available on base space. Um, Seekman Engine is one of those applications. You can see there's a handful of others. I think this is expanding in the future. Uh, we can go to different runs. These are some of the data sets that are available, and I believe under projects are a number of projects that, that I've been working on. And so your data can be moved up to base space. Um, right now, SeqMan Engine, um, it's, it's uh, kind of a, tr uh, a trial version. It's fully functional, but it's, it's limited to um, certain types of data sets, like de novo assemblies. Um, there's a base space demo that you can run here. And then I can pick my app, pick SeqMan Engine. And so now we can set up an assembly on base space using Seekman Engine. And in this case, these are some uh, bacillus genomes. There's a number of different samples here. And 
and we can set the pair distance in and estimated genome length, and then I just click Start Assembly. So again, it uses the default parameters for Seekman Engine, and you'll get a little note here saying that, um, so we'll get some emails now from Basebase, and, and I think within a half hour, everything will be assembled. So if we go to, when you go to your inbox, you'll have an output, um, output file, a Seekman Pro project file. Um, if you want to look at that project file, you can download it. Um, and look at a demo and uh, get a demo from uh, DNA Star to do your analysis. Um, and of course, if you want to uh, work with the software for your research, you can purchase a license of, of the core suite if you don't already own it. And so it's a very easy way to try out the de novo assembler. Um, it's very fast using all the resources up on the Illumina Cloud. Um, and, and these are the kind of offerings that we're going to expand in the future. Um, so you'll see uh, DNA Star Cloud here later this year. Where we'll have most of our apps available um, um, through the cloud. So at this point, I think we've, we're just out of time here. So I will uh, answer any questions that, that folks have. And if I don't get to you again, um, I'll uh, answer through email later today.